Good day everyone. Today we're going to take a look at another computer. This is an IBM NetVista model A22P made in 2002. I scored this for free along with uh, an IBM Think Center which uh, you may have seen in my uh, previous video I uploaded when I first got this computer and that other one. Yeah, sadly the Think Center turned out to have a bad motherboard, probably bad capacitors. What happened was when I put RAM in it and tried it for the first time, I installed Windows XP and it worked just fine. And then about two hours later, when it was still installing updates, it just froze solid all of a sudden, not even the mouse would move. And I tried restarting and it worked again for half an hour or so and then it locked up again. Well I kept restarting and I found it kept uh, it freeze it kept freezing up earlier and earlier. Um, I determined it wasn't the processor overheating. I tried different RAM. It wasn't the RAM. I ran Memtest 86 and it came out clean. And uh, I tried a different hard drive. That didn't help. It would still freeze solid. And uh, eventually, it actually wouldn't turn on at all anymore. I turned it on. It it wouldn't even post. The fans would just run at full speed, and that would, that was it. So uh, I determined it to be a bad motherboard. I uh, pulled a couple of useful parts from the machine and I threw it out. Too bad, that was a really nice machine. Thank you to those who corrected me. I was wrong about the uh, ranking of the processor. I said that the 3.2 GHz was the second fastest desktop Pentium 4 processor. That's wrong, it's actually the fourth um, after the 3.4, 3.6, and 3.8. I had the desktop and laptop Pentium 4s backwards. It's the laptop ones that went up to 3.4 gigahertz only. So yeah, too bad about that machine. I pro possibly could have replaced the capacitors, but I have so many computers now in my eyes it's not worth time and money to uh, fix one. And I wasn't even 100% sure that was the issue. It could have been an irreparable hardware problem. Who knows? But uh, this machine I've been using it and it has been working absolutely perfect so we're gonna take a look at this guy today so uh, of course um, there's been a little bit of confusion on the last video about where the NetVista stands in IBM's history of uh, personal computers the NetVista was the predecessor to the Think Center it was a business this was a business class workstation class computer and it was the predecessor to the Think Center the successor to the IBM Aptiva series and in some ways the IBM PC series and uh, yeah this is a full-fledged business class computer so uh, this was made in 2002 it's got a 1.8 gigahertz Intel Pentium 4 processor a first generation Pentium 4 based on the Willamette core and uh, it is a socket 478, which slightly surprises me. I expected it to be a socket 423, but I guess they switched from the 423 to the 478 fairly early. Um, yeah, the Willamette Pentium 4s, not a favorite among, you know, they weren't a very well-liked processor in their time, nor are they particularly sought after in the vintage computer community. Um, just because they were so darn slow compared to how fast they should have been. Um, I know, you know, the, the, the Willamette Pentium 4s went down to 1.3 gigahertz. The Pentium 3 went up to 1.4 gigahertz. And uh, if I remember right, based on benchmarks I've looked at online, a 1.4 gigahertz, a 1.3 or 1.4 gigahertz Pentium 3 blows a Pentium 4 of the same clock speed out of the water it's quite a bit faster so yeah the Willamette Pentium 4s you know first processors based on the new netburst architecture they uh, were not very fast they were actually quite slow for the time I believe the AMD Athlon and Athlon XP were much faster but uh, it's a cool system to have nonetheless kinda cool you know considering this was made in 2002 the Windows sticker actually says Designed for Windows 2000 or Windows ME. That's uh, pretty uh, pretty neat. A computer of this time normally would have had designed for Windows XP. And these were offered in a Windows XP configuration in which it would have an XP sticker. But this thing was ordered with Windows 2000. And uh, I looked online. You could actually order these with Windows 98. How about that? 
and the configuration that included Windows 98 had only 64 megs of RAM. How odd of a computer would that have been in 2002, a brand new computer, Pentium 4, with only 64 megs of RAM and Windows 98. Very, very interesting. Uh, this unit came with 128 megabytes of RAM, uh, standard. Uh, this thing's been upgraded to 384 megabytes, and I haven't changed it since then. I don't have any uh, RAM to spare at the moment. So uh, we've got a CD-ROM drive. I swapped the drive for the one from the Think Center because this drive has uh, it, it does better reading CDRW discs. But uh, unfortunately, while the original drive in this thing uh, opens and closes just fine, this drive uh, likes to get stuck and not want to open. That's a problem I find occurring more and more with C uh, older CD-ROM drives now is you press the button to open them and they won't open. They actually get stuck and that's because the uh, there's a magnet in the center of the drive where the spindle of the disc is and that magnet over time magnetizes another part of the drive and they actually get stuck together and the motor doesn't have enough power to open them. In the case of this drive you can actually hear the motor slipping so I imagine uh, a new belt would probably rectify that, give the motor a bit more traction and uh, it would work a lot better. Um, the zip drive, you may remember in the last video I said it was dead. Well here's some surprising news, uh, I actually fixed it. What I did was I opened up the drive and it turned out, at least in the case of this particular drive, the click of death wasn't an actual click of death, i.e. it wasn't the heads looking for track zero or whatever. It was actually a solenoid trying to engage the heads and failing to do so. The heads were actually stuck. Um, with zip drives, the heads are on a linear actuator like a... Uh, like a floppy disk drive, except instead of a stepper motor, it's a voice coil, just like a hard drive. So it's a linear voice coil, which is quite in a, uh, quite a uh, novel design. I just moved the heads by hand and it freed them up. This drive appears to work fine now. I stuck in a disk and when I use scan disk to do a full uh, surface scan just to test the drive, at one point it started making the actual click of death, but it did finish successfully. I tried the disk in another computer, and it also did that, but not to the same extent, so I'm not sure if uh, that's because my disk actually has some weak spots in it, which is strange considering it's a brand new disk, although it is new old stock, or maybe this drive is having some more issues, I don't know, but it does work anyway. I actually haven't tested the floppy disk drive yet, but I would be surprised if it uh, did not work correctly. Two USB ports on the front, they are USB 1.1, and power button, and there's a hard drive activity LED there, as well as a power LED. kind of like the design of this, it's very plain, you know, not much frills to it, just it's very flat. It's just a big flat slate, it's uh, kind of cool. We go around the back. We have a fan there, power supply. Uh, this uses, I believe, if I remember right, it's been a while since I've been inside this thing. It is a standard, it's electrically standard ATX, but physically it's, I don't know if it's an, a standard or something proprietary, but it's not a standard ATX size power supply. But electrically, it does appear to be ATX. PS2 ports, two more USB ports, two serial ports parallel. We have onboard Ethernet, pretty nice, onboard sound, and no onboard video. So bring your own video card when it comes to this computer. This computer has the video card it would have shipped with, which is an NVIDIA Vanta 16 AGP video card. So let's uh, take a look inside it. So to get into it, I'm going to put on its side here. Oh, we can take a look at the uh, at the sticker here. Manufactured for IBM Corporation, made in Mexico. Copyright 2001. This is a Canadian market computer. There's the machine type. Manufacture date, 207. The 2 means 2002. I don't know if the 07 is the week or the month. But we do know 2002. And yeah, that's about it. So uh, to open it up, it's actually kind of difficult, I don't know if it's supposed to be, but you press in on this button with one hand and yank on the cover with the other hand, 
And uh, yeah, I always have trouble opening this thing, but I'll see if I can do it without having to shut off the camera. Oh, yeah, I got it. So, um, there's actually been kind of funny. Uh, I think, yeah, like two, two things have broken on this computer since I got it. Um, when I got it, it originally had a... It had the original hard drive, a Maxtor D740X, which was basically a rebranded Quantum Fireball. It was working just fine, when all of a sudden one day, uh, it quit working. It wasn't giving the click of death, and it was still registering in the BIOS and everything, but it just wouldn't boot anymore one day, so I tried to reinstall Windows, and Windows actually couldn't format the hard drive. It said the disk is damaged. You know, it, the drive didn't give the click of death, it just sat doing nothing and then Windows would say the disk is damaged. I put the drive in the Compact Desk Pro EN and tried it and it was the same thing. It couldn't format the drive. So tra uh, a, a, a sector on track zero or something and a master boot record, I don't know. Uh, you know, a very critical part of the hard drive must have gotten some bad sectors and it made the hard drive absolutely useless. So uh, I replaced it with my last remaining loose Maxtor slimline and uh, this drive has been working just fine. I did something fun with the uh, other hard drive and I filmed it on video. I drilled a hole in the cover and then filled it with water while it was running and the results were absolutely hilarious. A lot better than I thought it would be. So I had that on video and I'll upload it here someday. The other thing that went bad on this computer, the CPU fan all of a sudden went bad at one point. Now, when I first got this thing, uh, the CPU fan was actually seized, which I, I wish I knew before I ran this thing for like two hours testing it, so it actually ran with uh, no, C no functioning CPU fan, and somehow it didn't overheat. I guess the first generation Pentium 4s didn't get that hot. And I oiled, oiled the fan, and it worked just fine. Well, a few days of using this computer later, um, I had it running, and I restarted it, and upon posting, in preparation for the restart, it said the CPU fan failed, and I'm like, what? And I opened it up, and indeed the CPU fan wasn't running at all. So I turned the computer off, well a few hours later, I turned it back on, and the CPU fan was running again. And then about half an hour later, I looked, and it wasn't running anymore. So, what would happen was the CPU fan would run fine, but then after running a while it would just stop and it would it, it was almost like it had to cool down a while before it would start running again very strange when the fan wasn't working it, i found that if you turn the computer off and turn it back on the fan would kind of jerk a little bit and that would be it and it wasn't seized it was still spinning just fine so yeah you know motor must have been burned out or something cpu fan was no good i don't have a fan of the right size so i replaced it with this slightly smaller fan I have it jerry-rigged in there with two screws, and it's working just fine. Keeps this thing plenty cool. So, yeah, not a very uh, <laughs> not a very good replacement, but it does work. So, heck, I'll keep it in there for as long as it works. So, uh, other than that, this thing's been working just fine. You have three RAM slots. This thing takes SD RAM. It, uh, there you see the standard 4-pin uh, ATX CPU connector common on these Pentium 4 systems as well as uh, AMD Athlon XP systems. That is a standard ATX power connector, 20 pin down there. And uh, there's the video card in the AGP slot, NVIDIA Vanta 16. Kind of interesting, I thought the Vanta 16 was based on the Riva TNT or TNT2, and I know that the um, ATI Rage 128 Pro is a more powerful card than the even the TNT2. But I benchmarked this card in 3D Mark 2001 SE, and I also benchmarked the uh, ATI Rage 128 Pro, and it turns out this card's actually quite a bit more powerful than the ATI Rage 128 Pro. So that's interesting. So I don't know if the Vanta 16, because the Van the Vanta line is in, was Nvidia's. Uh, value uh, based graphics card for like the OEM market and the low end market and according to Wikipedia they're I, at least if I remember correctly it said they were based on the Riva 
but evidently that's not the case in the of the uh, Vanta 16. I don't know if the Vanta 16 is based on one of the GeForce early GeForce chips or if it's its own independent design. No clue, but uh, yeah, kind of surprising. It's more powerful than the ATI Rage 128 Pro. That's a 16 megabyte card, and it's AGP 4X, if I remember correctly. We have three PCI slots, no ISA. And uh, yeah, all the capacitors look good. We have this option connector down there, which is interesting. I don't know where, uh, what's supposed to go there. I don't know. That port was perhaps used on a higher model of this that had more front panel connectors. But, uh, yeah, and of course the power supply, the reason, you know, it, this is a toolless design. You, uh, for the power supply, you move that and it lifts up, but I can't lift it up all the way. It's tethered by the, uh, 20 pin connector there, which in my opinion is kind of a poor design. You should be able, there should be enough length to lift the power supply up all the way so you can service the computer, but oh well. We have a built-in speaker, big speaker, look at that. 8 ohm, 1.5 watt, and uh, it sounds pretty good. It sounds a lot better than the Think Center did for the short time that computer was working. And I'm not sure if it sounds uh, better or worse than the Desk Pro's excellent internal speaker because I haven't had the internal speaker in the Desk Pro hooked up in a couple of years. I removed it just because uh, when it, if there was any beeping during post, it was so incredibly loud. And we've got a fan there, and the power supply has its own fan. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. So, um, oh yeah, you may remember in the, uh, in the last video, I mentioned how this used a toolless uh, design to add expansion cards that required a bracket that slid into place, and this thing's actually missing the bracket. And uh, as a result of that, the first time I tried this, when I plugged in the monitor, the computer was already turned on. It actually popped the card out of the socket while the computer was turned on, which amazingly did not crash it, because a few seconds later, the Windows startup sound played. So that's quite amusing, and I'm glad it didn't break anything. Well, I did what I said I'd probably do. I took a drill, and I drilled... Actually, I didn't take a drill. What I did was I took a self-tapping screw and a hammer, and I just tapped, I used the hammer, and I tapped on the screw until it punched a hole in there. And then I just screwed in the screw, and that made the hole big enough that a regular computer screw fits in there. And, uh, yeah, it works just fine, just like a normal expansion card setup now. I haven't bothered to do it for any of the other slots, but if I ever want to add any PCI cards to this thing, I will certainly go about and do that. So, uh, yeah good show. I'm glad that uh, worked as well as it did. I guess the last thing I'll show before we turn this thing on is uh, how the front panel comes off. To add or remove any drives, including the hard drive, you need to remove the front panel here. And I had no clue how to do it at first until I found the service manual for this thing. Well, I didn't even know, like, when the hard drive failed, I had no clue how to get the hard drive out, and I tried and tried, and I, I, it's like, how the heck do you get this out? Well, and then I found the service manual, which is luckily online, and it turns out you have to remove the front panel. And how you do that is, way back here, there's this button which you press until it goes pop, like that, and you can see the front panel already popped off, just lifts away, and there is the front panel. This thing is absolutely filthy. I'm out of compressed air at the moment. I've got to go buy more. Actually, I don't think you have to remove the front panel to um, get out the optical or uh, zip drive, but I do. you do need to, to remove the floppy drive or the hard drive. The hard drive's on this little tray which flips down like that, and then it's toolless. There's that purple uh, tab there, and tab there, you squeeze them, Oh, it's more of a two-handed job, but the hard drive slides upwards and out, and uh, it's pretty nice. Not too hard to do once you actually know how to do it. And I have a free spot there to add another five and a quarter inch drive if I ever wished. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So what I'll do is I'll put this thing back together. We'll hook up a 
monitor, keyboard, and mouse, and we will turn this thing on. I've got a clean installation of Windows XP on it. Alright, we're all hooked up. I forgot to mention the power supply is made by Akbell, and it's 185 watts, which surprises me. I would have expected a, lot, a much larger power supply in a computer of this regime. Anyway, we have a Microsoft USB optical mouse connected via a PS2 adapter. We have my Dell QuietKey PS2 keyboard because I'm a doofus. I didn't think to bring the IBM Model M home. And my IBM monitor. So, let's turn it on. The fans are able to run at two different speeds. You saw the post screen there briefly, IBM logo. I'm going to shut the lights off, make it easier to, uh, to see. Uh, keep that on. I got the speaker turned up a little bit. I'll crank it up here so you can hear what it sounds like. The case rattles when the speaker's turned up really loud. And it froze. Oh, there we go. Um, if I... Go into media here. Yeah, never heard that one before. I don't like it already. Is that all we have? One stop flourish and oh, I don't, I don't know what town is. I'll try that. Man, these all suck compared to the middies that came with old versions of Windows. Oh, that one's all right. So yeah, it's pretty good fidelity, and it gets loud. It gets a, the it rattles against the case though once you get loud enough and the right frequencies. So here it is. This is a clean Windows XP installation except for uh, 3D Mark there, which I used to benchmark it. Uh, the Vanta 16 card scored something like 1,400 odd some points. And blah blah blah. I have the unofficial Windows XP Service Pack 4 installed, so all the updates, the millions of updates since Service Pack 3 are already installed. And it is also enabled for Windows Pause Ready 2009 updates, which is awesome. Pentium 4, 1.8 gigahertz, 384 megs of RAM, and uh, I don't know what the maximum that can take is. I I think it's 1.5 gigabytes, if I remember correctly. But uh, yeah, nothing much that uh, needs more to be shown. Yeah, so uh, I guess we'll. Oh, I'll demonstrate the. Uh, actually, we'll demonstrate the floppy drive. I have no idea if the floppy drive is even any good. Um, I guess I'll take one of these 720k discs. Okay. Yeah, I, I've never tested the floppy drive. I have no clue if it works. And it looks like it's probably going to ask if uh, if I want to format it. Or maybe it'll just completely drop the ball. It's doing something. Oh, there we go. A is not accessible. Well, maybe, maybe it actually doesn't support 720k discs. I'll, uh... I'll do what I wasn't going to do because I'm too lazy and reach back here get one of my 1.4 meg discs. That disc has some bad sectors on it. 
Please insert a disk into drive A. Well, floppy drive probably needs to be clean. Perhaps lubricated. No big deal. I've got plenty of spares if I need to replace it. But what I am glad I was able to get working was the uh, zip drive. It's one of my zip disks. I still want to make a video about, uh, you know, the whole history of the zip disk someday. It's pros and cons. So we stick in our zip disk. This is a zip 250 drive. This is a zip 100 disk. They're compatible. Yeah. The heads are still working since I unstuck them. And yeah, there's the disc with the uh, iOmega 50 Ways program on it, where it gave you 50 ways to use a zip disk. And there it's open. So it is reading the drive. And uh, if I go, properties, almost 100 megs. And uh, if I do a scan disk, and I say scan for an attempt rec recovery of bad sectors. Usually when it gets to the halfway point, it starts it starts clicking like there's something wrong, but then it finishes. So maybe it's supposed to do that. Maybe the, maybe there's nothing wrong with the disk and or drive at all. Although I can't imagine that. But uh, yeah, maybe that disk is weak in uh, some areas in the middle of the disk. I don't know. Uh, it's chugging along. Yeah. It wasn't bad that time, just clunked once. So I guess I guess it's working. I'll have to test with my two other discs, which I accidentally left in my apartment. So we'll just cancel that. Well, apparently we can't cancel it. Guess I'll just let it finish. As you can see this IBM monitor works just fine very nice nothing wrong with it no bad no bad pixels I don't think there we go and uh... we just hit eject yeah so the zip drive works now great I figured it was curtains you know cause the click of death usually is curtains for a zip drive but uh... it wasn't even the real click of death it was just uh... A bunged up solenoid, or rather the heads were stuck and the solenoid failed trying to engage them. Very nice. And if I op try to open the drive here... Yep. It's, uh, it's what it does, it can open. There we go. That's usually how I get it to open. Happens to a lot of CD-ROM drives now, unfortunately. It's a very infuriating problem. But uh, it reads CDRW discs much better than the original drive, so that's why I switched it out. I would consider switching this out for a uh, DVD drive, but I think I only have one unused DVD-ROM drive left, so I'd want to keep it as a spare. Well, that's it. That's all there is to show for this thing. So uh, I'll just shut her down. So there you go guys, there's a look at the uh, IBM NetVista A22P from 2002. Pretty nice computer. So uh, glad to have it. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and uh, I'll see you in the next video.